Hey guys, it's Greg. Today I'm going to show you how to do image localization, which is a little more complicated than image classification. Here, there is still some object of a particular class, so it is either 0, 1, 2, up to 9, because this is MNIST. However, this MNIST digit has been placed randomly within this 100 by 100 grid, and our job is to both say what it is, this one is a 4, and draw a box around it, so we have to say where it is. Before we start, a huge thank you to Lawrence Moroni for creating this dataset and to AU Lockin for forking and fixing it. There were some issues. Thank you both. I'll leave links to your stuff in the description below. Okay, I'm just going to paste in the code to get the dataset. We're going to do a git clone to grab that dataset, do some Linux stuff, and then we're going to unzip those folders so we have both train and test. Okay, within your folder, you should see synthetic datasets and then MNIST and that will have a folder with all of the images and will have CSVs, testdata.csv and trainingdata.csv that hold the paths to each of the images and the label for those images. So we'll see that shortly. I also need to do a quick percent cd dot dot slash dot dot just to get back to the main directory. Okay, let's take a look at the CSVs. So we're gonna import pandas as pd and from OS, we're going to import path. And I'm going to create a couple variables. S is going to be synthetic datasets. That's the first layer of the folder. The second layer is MNIST. So M is equal to MNIST. And then I is going to be the images folder. Okay, that'll be useful for making things faster. Now we'll get train df is equal to pd.readcsv with path.join S and M. And it's located as training data.csv. And this actually has no header, so you have to do header is equal to none. We'll supply that now. And it turns out that the columns are going to be, first the one is the path, first column is the path, then the second one is the class index label, I label zero through nine. Then the next four are what we call x min and y min and x max and y max. We'll look at those shortly. And we'll just set train df dot columns equal to that columns list. And let's take a look at train df. So we have 60,000 images where each of these paths are the relative path. So let's take a look at that. Since this is train df, if you look over here in images, you'll see there's actually two folders. There's training and testing. And so since this is the train df, you would find these 60,000 within this training folder. And if you opened up the test df, they'd have different names that were in the testing folder. We'll close that up. And the second column is the class index. So converted training onepng that one is going to have a four somewhere. It's a four. And it has these four other values, x min, y min, and x max, and y max. So without explaining these quite yet, I just want to visualize it because it'll make sense after that. I'm going to quickly load up the test data frames, and then we'll do that visualization. So the same thing, but for test, we'll get test df is equal to pd.readcsv on path.join it will be s and m and then testing data.csv and it still doesn't have a header header is equal to none and then we're going to set test df.columns equal to columns it has exactly the same columns and then we're going to do a little bit more to get that full path because this relative path is really not enough so we'll get the full path by setting this variable t equal to well for the training stuff this folder, all of the stuff is in this folder, converted training. So we're setting t equal to mnist underscore converted training, capital T training. Then we're going to overwrite train df sub path. So overwriting that path and setting it equal to an apply on that column, train df sub path and then dot apply. This applies a function to every value in this. And so it's going to take a lambda, which takes a string s. So each time s is the current path, and it's going to return the path.join s on m on i on t on s. That seems confusing, but really it's just saying the full path. s is synthetic data sets, then m is mnist, then i is images, t is for us the training, because we're doing this first for training, and then s is that original file name. And so that is the full path there. If we do the same for test, we do have to slightly change t because t has to be 
this should be testing. And then we'll set testdf equal to testdf.apply and all of those same things. Sorry, testing data.csv should actually be test data.csv. So here with train df, we just added the full path there. So you can access the file immediately from this path. And then if you get test df, then it should look very similar, except if you were to actually look at this, it should say testing at the end. And so all of these paths are correct. Okay, let's just grab the first row of the training set and take a look at it. So row one is equal to train df dot iloc sub zero. That just means go into the train data frame and grab the row with the index of zero. So we're grabbing this first row here and that actually returns a pandas series. We're gonna convert that to numpy with to numpy and then just to a list with to list. And we'll take a look at row one. So it should be a list. We have the full path to that image and we have the class label four and those same values as before, but now it's just in a list and we'll use that to process it a little bit. Now we're gonna open up TensorFlow because it's what we'll be using to train the network as well as load the images. So import TensorFlow as TF and we're gonna do a little visualization to start. Import matplotlib.pyplot as PLT and we'll also grab numpy, import numpy as NP. Now I'm gonna write a quick function, define load image for viz. So this is just to visualize and understand it's not really fundamental to the code and it takes an image path, the full image path. Now we're trying to load an image and return it as a numpy array. We'll do that with image is equal to tf.io.read file and image path. And there is a reason we're using TensorFlow in particular here. There is other libraries you could use to load it, but I'll show you later why it's really important to use TensorFlow. Then we'll do image is equal to tf.image.decode. It's a PNG, so .decode PNG, they have a function for that. The image and then channels is equal to one because it is just a black and white image. It's not an RGB image, it's just a black and white image. So channels is one there. Now, when doing transfer learning on any pre-trained network, such as exception or efficient net, whatever network you wanna use, they usually expect the image is in three channels or RGB. And so we will convert this from grayscale to RGB. We just do image is tf.image.grayscale to RGB, and we pass the image there. Now for visualization, we're just gonna convert it to numpy in a particular format. Image is image.numpy dot as type with np dot uint 8 that's just so matplotlib can show it properly and we're going to return the image in this function okay then we can do something like plt dot show on load image for viz just calling that function and we're going to pass it row one sub zero because that is the path for the first image it is the path right there so putting that path in, it grabs the image, loads it up in NumPy as uint8, and there you go. We can see it's 100 in y, 100 in x, and there's our four right there. Okay, now we can make sense of those x min, y min, x max, y max values. So over here, if I just grab what they are here, it's 0 0.49, 0 0.15, 0 0.77, 0 0.43. I'm gonna zoom out a little bit. So x min is 0.49, x is this axis, 0.49, or if you multiply it by 149, 49 is about here. Y min is 0.15, or if you multiply it by 100, it's 15. So the first point, X min, Y min, is 49 and 15. That should be about here or so. So that looks like the top left corner of the box. Then X max, Y max, 0 0.77, 0 0.43, 0 0.77 or 77, and 43 should be about here. So x min y min is this x y coordinate here in the top left, and x max y max is this bottom right corner here. If we have the top left corner and the bottom right corner, we can just connect those lines and draw a box around that. So this is our bounding box for the image. Zooming back in, we're gonna do import matplotlib.patches as patches, and we're gonna grab im as load image for viz on row one sub zero. Same thing as before, that's just loading up that image and it's actually a numpy array in this format. Now, if you're really familiar with matplotlib, you might know what I'm gonna do. Otherwise, just follow along and it's not really that big of a deal. We'll get fig and ax equal to plt.subplots and then we'll do an ax.im show on the im. That just plots the image. But now we're also going to plot the box. 
we'll get x1, y1, x2, and y2, otherwise known as x min, y min, x max, y max. This is the top left corner of the box. This is the bottom right corner of the box. And then we're just going to make these equal to the int of v times 100 for v in row from two until the end. Now this looks complicated, but basically it's just getting those values from this list here. So this is two onward, zero, one, two, get those four values. We're gonna multiply them by 100 to get the pixel value and then convert that to an integer just so that this is 49, 15, 77, and 43. Okay, so scrolling back down, we have each of those values, x1, y1, x2, y2, and I'm just going to print those so we can see it along with the plot itself. And I'm just gonna print those so we can see it along with the plot, x1, y1, x2, y2. And then we're going to get the width is equal to x2 minus x1, and height equal to y2 minus y1. Then we'll get this variable rect is equal to patches dot rectangle, and then we pass it x1 and y1, and then the width and the height. We'll specify the line width is equal to one, and the edge color is equal to R for red, and face color is just going to equal none. And then we can do an x dot add patch on the rectangle, and we'll do a plt dot show. And you should see that we have an error name row is not defined. This should be, sorry, row one right there. And as we see our coordinates 49, 15, 49, 15 is right there. 77, 43 is right there. And there you go, we plotted this rectangle around our box. So our model is going to figure out what image this is and how to draw this box around the image. Now this is simultaneously a regression and a classification problem. If we scroll up to our data set, you'll see there's a classification piece. This is going to end in a soft max to try and predict the best class of the index. And then we also have to do a regression on these four values, x min, y min, x max, and y max. And so classification and regression. So part of this network does classification. The other part does regression. The classification part has to minimize its cross entropy and the regression part has to minimize its mean squared error. Simultaneously, the network has to minimize both of these things. It's a little complicated and we're gonna get into the specifics in a bit. Okay, scrolling back down, I'm gonna look at the data set just a little bit more to make sure things are good. The length of, say, the training data frame is 60,000. The length of the test data frame is 10,000, same as it is for MNIST. We could look for balancing issues. So train df subclass index, that column dot value counts, look at how many there are of each. We have about the same amount of each digit, so there shouldn't be a problem with misbalancing. I'll now split the test data frame into val and test. So we'll do val df and test df is equal to test df up until 5,000. So it's gonna be the first 5,000, and then we'll put the second 5,000, 5,000 onward that's going to go to the test. So val is the first 5,000, test is the second 5,000, and just to look at the length of both of those, length of val df and length of test df are 5,000 each. Okay, to load our outputs, it is gonna look a little bit different than you're used to. And there is multiple ways to do this, but I'll show you probably the easiest way. I'm just gonna paste this variable in here. Box columns is x min, y min, x max, and y max, and I'm gonna deal with the box stuff first. We're really just going to convert all of these in the train test and validation to NumPy. Now I'm going to deal with the train data frame first. Boxes train is going to be a NumPy array of the box stuff, but for the training data set. So that's nothing more than train df sub the box columns. Get that matrix, but that says pandas. We'll convert that to NumPy like that. Now I'll do the same for val and test. So just going to copy and paste this in here. This is going to be going to test that is test, test, and this is going to be val, and this is also going to be val. So now we have the train, test, and validation, all of the box stuff as NumPy. Now I'm gonna deal with the index or class stuff. So that is gonna be class indexes, starting with train, class indexes train, is train df sub the class index. It's just this one column, luckily, class index dot to NumPy. 
So that's going to be just a vector of the class indices for train. We're going to do the same for val and test. So this is going to be test and test. And this is going to be val. And that is going to be val as well. Okay, I'm just going to let that run and I don't need to look at anything for now. Now we're going to be dealing with some pretty TensorFlow specific stuff here. And don't worry about it if you don't get it the first time around. I probably wouldn't either. We're going to make a function that can properly load an image and a little bit more than that in TensorFlow. At tf.function, we need to make it in this wrapper. And we'll do define load image given an image path. That makes sense intuitively. We're trying to load an image given the full path. And label dict. Don't worry about label dict for now. It's really not going to make sense yet. We'll do really the same steps as we did before. And so I'm going to copy and paste these in here. Image is tf.io.read file image path. We load it up and then we decode the image in channels as one because that's what it originally is. And then we convert it to three channels with grayscale to RGB. Now, instead of returning just the image, we're going to end up returning the tuple of the image. And this thing we still don't know what it is yet, label dict. Don't worry about it. That's our function. Now our data sets have got to be TensorFlow data sets here. So we'll make train data set equal to the tf dot data dot data set. And it's from tensor slices. Check out the TensorFlow data set documentation if you want to really, really look at that. I also have a video on the subject. I'll link that in the description. And that's going to be the tuple of two things. It'll be train df sub path. And then we're just going to convert that to a list. So dot to list, that looks confusing, but it's just the path of all of the stuff in the training set. That's fine. And then this is going to be a dictionary. Hence, this is label dict. It's the dictionary of the labels. Normally, you just have that as a NumPy array or a list or whatever it is representing your outputs, except here, your labels or your outputs has got to be a dictionary because some parts go to the classification part and some parts go to the box part. And so here it's going to be a dictionary that says, okay, dealing with the box part, we'll call that box. And this is going to be boxes train. Boxes train is this variable we defined here. So we have the variables x min, y min, x max, and y max. And we got all of those in the pandas data frame for train. And we converted that to a numpy array. So all you need to know is this deals with the boxes stuff for the train. And then the other part of the dictionary is the class stuff. So we're going to call this class. And then we pass the class indexes train. That's the same thing as above, except it's the class stuff. It's just that vector of the classes. So now we have all of our labels in a dictionary, which says all the box stuff, that's you, and all the class specific stuff, that's you here. So now this data set is made up of examples where we have the path to the image, that's your input. And we define this function to say how to load the image. And we also have its label, which is the box stuff is this box piece and the class stuff is this class piece. Again, if you don't understand this fully, seriously, don't worry about it. I'm just trying to explain it the best I can. We'll output train data set and I wouldn't even recommend taking a look at that. It probably will confuse you more than it'll help you. We're now going to do the same for val and test. And so I'm just going to copy it from my notes here because it's exactly the same as it is above, except anywhere you see train, we're going to pass val instead and all the val stuff and test is exactly the same, except everywhere it is test stuff instead. So now that we have train test and validation data sets loaded up properly. Now to show you, we can actually use our load function and to give a little bit of intuition as to how TensorFlow is using this, we're going to get an iterator. So an iterator is equal to iter on the train data set. And that's nothing more than an iterator, which will loop over the train data set. Now, if you haven't used iterators before, they're nothing more than a manual loop over the data set. So we'll do next on iterator. And that each time just gets the next example. And here it's still going to look confusing. So please don't worry about what that looks like. It turns out that if you were to really unpack and take a look at this, if you call load image on unpacking, that's literally the unpack operation, unpack next of the iterator and then bracket bracket sub zero dot numpy dot shape. Don't worry if you have no idea why that's totally okay. It turns out that that gets the next image, which is 100 by 100 by 3. We did convert the grayscale image to three channels, and this load image function is what TensorFlow will be using to load up the images when it's calling dot fit. 
something slightly more complicated if you copy and paste this. I'm not even going to bother saying it because it's a little bit messy. If we want to plot it, well, this is plotting one image. And each time it calls next, and so it will get the next image every time. And so you could loop over this as long as you wanted to see each of the images in the training set. Now we loaded up our training test and validation data sets, but we haven't said the pipeline to tell TensorFlow what to do with them. We need to start by importing from tensorflow.data import auto tune. This is used for parallelization purposes. And then we're gonna get this shuffle val, which I'm putting in capitals because it's a hyperparameter. It's not really a very important one, just set it equal to the length of the training data set, and I'll show you how to use it shortly. Next, we need to choose the batch size, and this one actually is a very important hyperparameter. It turns out if you do four on Colab, it'll fit it in RAM, so it'll work well, and it will actually train it pretty decently with the other hyperparameters we'll set up. Then we set up the pipeline for how to load the training data set. So train data set is equal to train data set, dot shuffle. So the first thing we're going to do on each epoch, this says on each epoch, train dataset dot shuffle with the shuffle val. Don't worry about that. It just means, hey, let's shuffle the data set around. We're doing that for train because you want to make sure that your training data set is shuffled on each epoch. You want different batches every time. And then we need to say, hey, right now these are just paths to images. We need to map the load image function. Load image has been a carefully defined function so that it will tell TensorFlow how to efficiently turn the path into an actual image. And then we'll also do dot batch. So we'll batch them into the batch size of your preference for works pretty well. And then we also need to do for optimization dot prefetch with auto tune. Don't really worry about that. It's just for optimization. And I will just zoom out quickly so that you can see what that is. I'm going to zoom back in after we're done this part. Then we'll do val dataset. So set the val pipeline. Val dataset is val dataset. Well, there's no need to shuffle because it's just evaluating some metrics every time. So val dataset.map. Well, we do need to load image because it certainly needs to actually grab the images from the paths. And then we'll still batch it because we need to make sure it fits into memory still. So batch size at whatever, say four. And then again, end it in dot prefetch with auto tune. So it does it parallelized in a good way. And test data set is going to be identical to the val data set, except everywhere you see val, we just want to replace that with test. So test there, test there as well. And there you go. If we look at train data set and val data set, and test data set, then we should see those three things. And again, it's going to look more confusing than helpful, so don't really worry about it. Okay, now we're ready to actually define the model. And we're going to be doing transfer learning on whatever convolutional net you prefer. We're going to be doing efficient net V2S, V2 small. It's going to be really good, and it's not going to be too clunky, so it won't take forever to train, although it will take quite a while. So we'll get this with from tensorflow.kiras.applications dot efficient efficient net underscore v2 will import efficient net v2s okay and then model is going to be an instantiation of that efficient net v2s where weights are coming from image net so we're going to transfer learned from those weights learned on image net and we don't want the top because the top generally ends in a 1000 dimensional softmax specific to image net but we don't want that we're just using it as a feature learner and so we'll do include top is equal to false and then we'll set input shape equal to our shape is 100 by 100 by 3 dimensional images and there we go if we say model.summary, and sorry, this actually doesn't have an underscore between efficient and net. I don't know what I'm spelling wrong, so I'm just going to copy from my notes, and I'm sure that I was spelling something wrong there. Replace it with that, and model.summary should show that default model. Okay, and it takes a long time to load this because it actually has a bunch of different layers. I'm really only going to show you the top and bottom layers. I'm going to zoom out a little bit. That's too zoomed in. If we look at the very top of this model here, it takes in a 100 by 100 by three dimensional image. It does do a rescaling layer. This does the pre-processing method. We don't have to worry about how it pre-processes things. And so we're making sure to pass it uh, integer values first. We have it set up so that it will do that. It'll pre-process it correctly there. And then we're going to go down at the very, very end. This convolutional net will process this image and turn it into 
boom, four by four by 1280. So you can think about this as a 1280 channel image or four by four feature maps with 1280 feature maps, whatever interpretation you want, it turns this into a four by four by 1280 rectangular prism. Now there's some flexibility on how you can choose to use transfer learning. Although what we're gonna do is go in for layer in the model.layers and then most of them, but not all of them, in model.layers up until we'll say negative five, we'll set the layer.trainable equal to false. So basically freezing all of those layers, freezing almost all of the layers, except leaving a little bit near the end, we're mostly using it as a fixed function, although we are allowing a little bit of learnability in the final layers. Now here's step two in creating our model. We're gonna do from tensorflow.kiras.models we will import sequential. So we're gonna take this thing and add some sequential pieces to it. And I like doing from tensorflow.kiras.layers, importing star just so we have all of them there. Now we're gonna call my model equal to the sequential where it takes in first model that is going to take an image of 100 by 100 by three, and it's just going to turn it into a four by four by 1280. Something very common to do, and it's what they would be doing, I'm predicting, is at this 4x4x1280, four by four by after this, we do what's called a global average pooling. We can think about this as 1280 different 4x4 four four squares. If you take one of those 4x4 four four squares and stretch it out into a vector, you would have 16 values. If you calculate the average of those 16 values, you would be left with just one number, the average of those values. Therefore, if you do that for all of these 1280 squares, you would be left with 1280 averages, and that's exactly what a global average pooling would do. It would calculate the average across each of those squares and then just return its result. If we add in a global average pooling in 2D, that is going to turn it into from four by four by 1280 into just 1280. It's just those averages. The other way to do this is by flattening. Although if you flatten, you'd have a lot of values there. Now we're gonna allow a little more flexibility. And so we'll do dense 64 activation is equal to ReLU. So we're transforming those 1280 values, doing a matrix multiplication to get 64 values here. And if we close this off, we can see that if we do a my model dot summary, it's not gonna bombard us with all of the original stuff. It's just treating efficient net as a function that takes in a 100 by 100 by three image. It converts that into four by four by 1280. And then we do a global average pooling, get those averages to convert it down to 1280. And then we can just do a linear layer to get it down to 64. Now we have a 64 dimensional feature vector from the image. Now step three in creating this model is probably the most confusing. We're gonna do from tensorflow.kiras.models and import model because this step needs the functional API which allows for multiple paths. This is a multiple output model and so we're gonna be using this to make multiple output paths. We do have to start with the input for this. So image input is an input which takes in a 100 by 100 by three dimensional image. Now we can get a feature vector. Feature vector is equal to my model of image input. Okay, we write it like this, which basically says a use my model, which we know takes a 100 by 100 by three image and converts it all the way down to a 64 dimensional feature vector. So I'm saying feature vector is past that input through the my model, and then we get our 64 dimensional feature vector stored in this. Now we'll deal with the class path because we need to convert this feature vector into two paths. One path needs to split off and deal with the class stuff, and the other path needs to split off and do the box related stuff. So dealing with the class stuff first, we have class output path equal to dense of say 128. This could be whatever value for now, dense 128, and activation is equal to a ReLU and give that the feature vector. So what this says is, hey, take your feature vector, your 64 dimensional feature vector, and then you pass it through a linear layer to get 128. Now that we have 128, well, that's not necessary. You actually didn't even have to do this. I'm just allowing a little bit of flexibility here. Now we're gonna take these 128 values and we're gonna map that into what we really need, which is class output path is equal to dense of 10 and activation is equal to softmax. And we're gonna give this a name, which is class. Why am I giving it the name of class? Well, if we scroll all the way up to what our data set was defined as, we are passing it as the label was a dictionary where it had class and box. 
These need to map up because class is pointing to the class labels and box is pointing to the box labels. Here in the model, we are saying, hey, your class layer is your activation soft max and 10 because this is the part that deals with the class stuff. If you've done MNIST before, it should end in this, a 10 dimensional softmax layer. This is the same thing, it's just one end of the path. This deals with what class the object is. And so this has to take in the class output path because it first went to 128. You could have made that 64, 32, or even omitted it. This was not necessary, but you continue on this path and you go into the class output path. And this is your end of your class path. Now we have to deal with the box path. So box output path is equal to dense. Again, you don't have to have anything here. It's really the equivalent to this 128. We'll say 128 here as well. And then an activation equal to ReLU, just to add a little bit of complexity and give that the feature vector. So the feature vector goes and splits into two paths. It splits into the class output path into this 128. And then we'll say this 128, a separate 128. This has nothing to do with this 128 over here. We split it off into a new path and that feature vector goes into both of those things. Then we need to continue on that path and the box path needs to end in what you'd expect it is. It's a dense of four where the activation is linear and so we don't have to write that. This is a regression problem and so the activation is just nothing, it's linear. And the name of this thing has to have the same name as your labels were set up as. It is box in this case, that's what we added earlier. And then that takes in the same path, box output path. Okay, now just finishing this off, we say that model one is equal to the model where you pass your list of inputs equal to your image underscore input. That's your image right there. It's just one image, so that's not too bad. But here, your outputs is a list of outputs and it has the class output path. That's the part that deals with the class stuff. That's that variable there. And then your other output is your box output path. That's the part that deals with the regression problem or the box stuff. Now, if we do a model one dot summary, this is the whole model put together and it looks like it's a linear thing, although I'll explain the nuance here. We have an image that takes 100 by 100 by three. It does that beginning stuff and converts it to a 64 dimensional feature vector. Then the 64 gets split off into two paths. The one path is this 128 here and the other path is this 128 here. So it makes it look like it goes from this 64 to this 128 to this 128 afterwards, but that's not what's happening. It's saying this 64 goes into this 128 and this 64 also goes into that 128 and this 128 goes into this 10 and this 128 goes into that four. There is two separate paths here, although it's not printing it quite right. Okay, now we need to do compile. And just like the other stuff that was more complicated because this is multiple outputs, this is more complicated too. We're gonna grab a bunch of imports and I'll just really copy them in here because it's a little irritating. From tensorflow.curious.losses import mean squared error and sparse categorical cross entropy. Because we didn't bother to convert the class indice labels to one hot vectors, they are simply the index representing what digit it is, we have to use sparse. And so that side is gonna optimize the categorical cross entropy. And the other side, the box side, is going to optimize the mean squared error. We're going to use one optimizer, the atom optimizer, and we're going to get a couple metrics of interest. For the categorical stuff, categorical accuracy is interesting. And mean absolute error will be a little more helpful than mean squared error for the box stuff. Now we are going to compile the model. So model1.compile, where the loss, well, it's not just one loss. One part of the model has to optimize the categorical cross entropy, and the other part has to optimize the mean squared error. Loss is equal to the dictionary, similar to the dictionary of labels above, class, which points to the sparse, I'm just gonna copy it over here. That is optimizing the sparse categorical cross entropy. And the box side, box is going to optimize the mean squared error. So this dictionary looks pretty similar to above. We have class and box. And so in our layers here, we have class. The class is going to optimize the sparse categorical cross entropy. And the box is going to optimize the mean squared error and the model together is going to optimize a combination of these things. That's what it's trying to do, is get good at both of these things. Then we will just set our optimizer equal to atom with a learning rate 
equal to say 0.001. Luckily, that's really not any different. That's not too bad. And then metrics is also gonna look like the same dictionary because again, you have different outputs and you have to say which metrics you want to look at for each of those things. And so we'll say class looks at the list of just the categorical accuracy like that. And then the other part of the dictionary, the box that is going to look at, we'll say the mean absolute error. Okay, that's common for regression stuff. And then we will close our dictionary and close our compile as well. Okay, we compile that, get no errors. I am going to do a quick early stopping. I'm just gonna copy this in here from TensorFlow Curious Callbacks, import early stopping and get an early stopping callback with the patients is one, monitoring the val loss. So that says if we ever hit an epoch where we actually went up in the validation loss, well, that's not so good. And so we are going to stop it. Now model fit is really easy because we use TensorFlow datasets. And so it's just model one dot fit with the train data set and the validation data is going to be equal to the val data set. And we'll set epochs to something it'll never reach because early stopping will handle that. And then callbacks, callbacks is equal to the list of yes should work. So let's let that run. Um, you shouldn't have any fast training because by default here, I am not using a hardware accelerator. It is just using the CPU, but let's make sure I have no errors here and it's loading. Okay, perfect. So it's loading. We say uh, an estimated time expectancy of 30 minutes per epoch, which is uh, horrendously bad. Um, the loss is about two. Now check this out because we actually have a big problem here, which we're about to fix. The class loss is really, really dominating the full loss here. If you see, this is about 1.64. The class part is about 1.6 now, and the loss is 1.67. Almost all of the loss is dedicated to the class loss because this box loss here is so much smaller in comparison. We can see the class loss is so much bigger than the box loss. In fact, if you take if you take 1.45, the class loss, and divide that by 0 0.0609, that's the box loss, you get a value of say 23. What you can do here is go in and say, hey, wait the loss function, give it more effort on the box loss, because this is barely giving it any attention, and the model starts at being bad at both of these things, it's just that these values look different. And so we have to say, hey, no, treat the box loss as important as the class loss. To do that, we can do something in here where we specify that the loss weights is again a dictionary that looks pretty much the same thing as above. We have the class, the weight for the class is going to be one, so don't multiply it by anything. These are values we'll multiply each part of the loss function by. So don't multiply the class loss by anything and then multiply the box loss by about 100, seems to work pretty well. That's just what I tested in practice. So if we add that in there, we multiply the box loss by 100. I'm going to remove that. And now it's not gonna be perfect. I don't expect this to be super, super perfect. But what we should see here is, hey, look, the loss itself is pretty big, but the box loss is now pretty important. And it's kind of balancing it too much now. Now the class loss isn't contributing as much as it should be. It's actually only like a fourth or so, but it's a lot better. And so if you did say, maybe set this to, we'll say 25, it kind of changes as you were to change this thing. And actually every time you do this, you probably should go through and create your model and compile the model again. So we'll run that and then we'll say around 25 or so, maybe that's a little bit better. Now we have that the class loss looks about half of what the actual loss is. That's what we want. If this is not multiplied by anything, that means that it by itself is taking up roughly half, maybe a third. It's looking like each of these two portions are taking a considerable portion of the loss, which is all that really matters. It doesn't have to be perfect. This class loss does not have to be exactly half of the loss. As long as they are both considered important things to the loss function, it still will be computing gradients that move the model in the direction of both of those things. That's what we want. Okay, so I'm just gonna stop this. And what you would do if you wanted to train this is go to runtime, change runtime type, and go to GPU, and then you just want to run all to make sure it runs again. Now, I actually had to stop this because I figured out that it doesn't like this categorical accuracy as is. I guess that doesn't work well with sparse, and so I'm just gonna convert this to the string of accuracy 
in the metrics. And I'm just going to create the model again. So from say this part, the sequential part, we will run that again, and then I'll run the next one again. And then if I go to compile the model, early stopping and train the model again, we should see that an accuracy actually makes sense. Before it was getting it was getting stuck at 0.1 or so, which is definitely not right. And we see here, if I go over to class accuracy, there you go, it started at about 30%. It's climbing very fast. So yeah, it doesn't seem to like that categorical accuracy. Okay, now what you would do is you would let this train and you would train that for as long as you want and you would have a model. However, I would not blame you if you didn't want to wait for this and you wanted to just take something that I already created. So luckily I've already done this. And here, if you go to the notebook in the description, I'll leave a link to the model. You can just go and download that from my Google Drive and you can upload that back. And I'll give you the steps here on loading that back up. If you wanted to save your model, what you would do is model one, dot save and then directory so model there i'm not going to run that because i have no need to save that so just put that in a comment uh, if you wanted to zip your folder and download it you would need to do exclamation zip and then dash r model dot zip model so that says go to your model file and then recursively zip it and i'm not going to do that again but if you saved your model and then you wanted to zip and download it that's how you would do that uh, here I will include the link to mine and so you can go and download it here and then what you would do is after you downloaded mine you would need to upload it back as a zip here and if it was there you would do unzip with model.zip and I'm not going to do that either. So these are the steps for if you wanted to save your model, do that. If you wanted to zip and download it, you would do that. If you wanted to grab mine, it'll be here and unzip model.zip. After you go and upload back mine or yours or whatever model, it would be a zip and you would need to unzip that model and you would do it like that. Okay, and then after that, you would have to load the model back up. And so you would do model one is equal to tf.kiras.models.load model and then the model directory that shows up from that. Again, I am not going to do that either, but that's how you'd load back your model up so that it would be the same as after you called fit, you would have that model variable, except then you don't have to worry about all the training if you do that stuff. Okay, now I'm gonna show you how to visualize it a little bit. And I'm gonna get a little lazy with the code because it's been a lot of code. And so if I paste this in here, this is essentially the exact same as what we had above for our plotting. And so I'm just going to look at the first row of the test data frame instead. That's really the only change here is this is the test data frame. And so I'm going to run this. I'm going to zoom out so you can see the code if you are really wanting to copy that. And here, so I got a six and I plotted, this is the actual label on that. Now this is the actual bounding box and it's located at 3423. So 3423 and 6251, 6251. Let's see if our model can get the same one. We can look at the image with the numpy.array as a batch because models take a batch. So the batch of just load image for viz row one sub zero. And then if we look at the shape of this, all I'm doing is loading up the first image in the test data frame. And we're gonna load it up as a numpy array and then put it into a batch. If we look at the shape of that, we see there's one image and it's in a 100 by 100 by three. This is what our model will take as an input. And so we'll just make a variable equal to that. So we do image is equal to that exact same thing, except without looking at the shape, we can see what our model predicts from this input. If we do prediction array is model one dot predict on the image. This is what it will predict for that input. We can see it's this really complicated thing and we have to parse it a little bit. It is an array where we have two arrays. The first one is 10 dimensional. So this looks like a probability distribution over the class. And the second one is four numbers. So this looks like the box numbers, X min, Y min, X max, and Y max. These are all the predictions for that. Now we can get the predicted class. So predicted class is equal to the np.arg max of the prediction array sub zero dot two list sub zero and then bracket. Don't really worry about the particulars there. If you really were to unpack this thing, it would work out to that. Your predicted class is six. It says nothing more than says which of these values in the probability distribution are biggest. It looks like it was confused between either a six and a nine. And that kind of makes sense. They look like pretty similar objects just flipped around. And so this has a 50% chance or 50% thought 
that it's a six. And so we take the largest value, it's that, and it thinks it is a six. We can get predicted box equal to the prediction array sub one dot to list and then sub zero. Again, looks confusing, just unpack it. And we get that the predicted box or predicted X min Y min X max Y max is these values here. And if we were to take the same visualization function, again, I'm not really gonna go over it. I will just zoom out if you wanna take a look at what I wrote here. We have row one sub zero, which loads up the path to that image. And then the predicted box instead of the actual box, well, we're gonna put that around the image and it puts it right there. This is actually the model that barely trained at all. And you can see it actually did a pretty decent job already, but it's not quite right. I'm going to use my pre-trained model. And so you have to make sure that you've uploaded your model.zip here, or you have some model available that you'd like to use. I just need to wait for that to upload. And you didn't see me, but I did go and upload this from my computer. Okay, so I have model.zip fully on there. So I'm gonna use some of my utility functions that I commented out above here. So I need to unzip model.zip and we'll let that run. We have invalid syntax, sorry, the exclamation unzip model.zip. And there you go. It should create this folder of model here. And then we need to load the model back into the variable. And so I will run it that there. Some of these pieces might take pretty long, by the way. Okay, so it loaded back up into that variable. I'm just going to run this stuff again. There's the actual box around this six. And then we get our prediction, which should look a lot stronger than this one here. And you'll see most of the numbers are going to turn to e to the negative something because it's really powerful in only one spot. It will be powerful in this spot here. Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. This is the spot. And so it thinks it's a six really strongly. Here we have the box as well. It still thinks it's a six. It's just a stronger prediction. We have a box that's going to be moved over a little bit. And here we go, we run that again, and then we should see closer, okay? So it's not super, super perfect, but it's really close enough. As long as it goes around the image itself, you really can't go wrong with that. Of course, the actual box is maybe more around like this, but it does cover the image. So that's really all we care about. Now there's two more things I'd like to talk about. One is just really simple. And if we were to zoom in and make an image of just what this box is in covering, that's basically just saying, go get the image. We can do that with plt.imshow with im from y1 to y2, our predicted y1 and y2, and our predicted x1 and x2. We can just get an image of that and take a look at it. There you go, that's our six. It did get the whole image, so it's perfect in my eyes. Now the last piece here is really important. When we are going to train our model, so I'm just gonna let it train for a brief moment here. If you look at the metrics of these things, I used the accuracy for the class portion. Since our data set is balanced, there's roughly the same amount of each digit in the data set, you know that this means the model is doing pretty well. However, we use the mean absolute error as a metric, and that doesn't really mean very much. Aside from this value being very, very small, it really doesn't mean much at all. The best metric that you could use, which would be kind of analogous to class accuracy, but for the box, it's something called intersection over union, or IOU. I'm not gonna explain exactly mathematically what it is, but here is the actual box label, and here is the predicted box label. The IOU gives a fraction of the percentage of overlap. So here, if the actual box is something like this, and your predicted box is something like this, it would have an IOU, in this case, of about 70%, maybe 80%, because mostly the predicted box is overlapping with the actual, but it's not perfectly overlapped, as in the boxes are not the same. If the boxes were the same, it would have an IOU of one, and if they were totally different, like if the predicted box was way over here, well, it would have an IOU of zero because there's no intersection at all. That's really all we need to get into it for now. I'd just like to say that if I were to make this a little bit better, I would go into model fit and create a custom metric that always told you the IOU because during training, it's a little bit hard to tell whether the model is good at making a box or not. Okay, I bet you learned a lot if you got all the way through this. Please drop a like on the video if you did watch this all the way through. It would really help me out, and this took a lot of effort, like several days. This is the longest tutorial I've made in quite a long time. Happy learning, have a great day guys, and I'll see you later.